This is a podcast for nice guys. How do you want to be remembered? Someone who sacrificed everything or a man who got what he wanted while positively influencing others along the way? Join us to learn how to lead from the bedroom to the boardroom from the only international coach for nice guys, your host, Ashley Cox. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to a podcast for nice guys. Today, I have David K. Hutchinson. David was born and raised in the Midwest. He served six years in the military and one tour of duty. David came from nothing but a small town and a family with no wealth. After battling poverty, depression, and near suicidal times, David worked his way up in the financial world from life insurance to consulting and estate planning to now running his own financial company, working with wealthy families, athletes, influencers, and private equity companies. David has learned the art of developing the self, the body, and the mind, which ultimately builds a life of monetary wealth, abundance, and freedom. David's life and legacy goal is to help others dig out of ruts, mediocrity, and to lead a life by design with all of the freedoms one can think of. David believes our society makes it hard on purpose. The financial industry, food industry, banking industry, and even the education system are all set up to keep us down, struggling, depressed, and broke. David's legacy companies are what he believes is the key to fighting back against that. Thank you so much for joining us today, David. It's nice to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. Pleasure to be here. Yeah, I'm really excited to talk to you because you've had quite the journey from being in the military, depressed, drinking a lot, to now being this powerhouse of a man and taking back your power. So my first question for you is, what would you like to say to nice guys? Nice guys. Gosh, that's a phrase that I feel like everybody just uses. Oh, that guy's so nice. Or just in general in society. Oh, that person's nice. But it's so surface level, right? You can be nice and have a total chaotic life that doesn't make sense, right? Nice guys need to understand that divine masculinity is not nice. Nice guys get the girl, not always true. And in seldom cases, it is true because at the end of the day, women aren't looking for just nice, right? They want an actual security provider, divine masculine being by their side. And just being nice, your grandpa's nice. (laughs) So that's really what I would say is that there's so many depths to this game of life. And I think that men need to start internally looking at, okay, Am I living a one-dimensional or a four-dimensional life? And I talk about the four-dimensional life a lot. What's a four-dimensional life to you? Your mind, body, spirituality, and then your relationships. I feel that deeply men are called to be providers, to create. And that starts with the internal, your connection with yourself, your connection with God, who you show up as a man and how you think about the world, the lens that you see the world through. Ultimately, that's going to define the quality of your relationship, the quality of who you are, the quality of your money, the quality of the people around you. And I think a lot of men today, and again, I want to preface this, it is it is their fault and it's not their fault at the same time, right? You have a responsibility to do something about the life you're leading, but at the same time, society has trained men to be the nice guy. Society has trained people that masculinity is toxic. Now, don't get me wrong. There's a certain element to the Andrew Tates of the world, if you know who that is. Not exactly the best version of my opinion, masculinity, right? There are some elements to that guy that makes sense. There's some other elements that's like a little bit toxic, okay? So we can dive into more of that later, but really the reality is that if I can just have your listeners today understand one thing, it's that whoever you are today and whatever results you're not getting that you want, maybe you're sitting out there, you're broke, you're overweight, you don't have a girl that you're like in love with, or you just don't have a relationship at all, you can change all of it. You can literally change all of it. I was a dude that was literally sitting on my parents' old house when they divorced. I took care of their house for a while, sat in the basement, drunk off Jack Daniels with not a dollar to my name, and I wanted to kill myself. My girl had just left me. The only thing that kept me from doing the risk deal was I looked over at my dog, and I was like, who's going to take care of him? The provider in me was like, I can't do this. And I slept it off and I got up and that very next day, the first thing I did is I dumped out all the alcohol and I went to the freaking gym. So that's the biggest thing I can tell men is that take charge of your mind, take charge of your body, take charge of what you can control right now. If you're in a place listening to this and you're like, my life is in shambles and I want to end it. You are valuable son of God. You are a man called to be a provider. And right now it might not make sense. There's not this reality that you're experiencing that you're like, oh my God, this is so great. You're like, no, I'm in a terrible place. I was too. And today, fast forward 12 years later, I have a life by design with an amazing woman by my side, purchasing the dream property of my dreams, 55 acres in the middle of nowhere with a big house. 
right? I literally look back at that point in my life and I'm like, wow, I'm glad that dude didn't give up. There's really nothing I want anymore in life. Now I have goals and aspirations that I'm like, I want to create this and I want to do this with these people. And I want to grow something that I can feel passionate about. And I want to have children to pass all these things on to the next generation. But as a man right now, figuring out the game of getting the girl, becoming the guy, making the money, feeling good about myself, figure that out. Wow. How long did it take you after you dumped out the alcohol and went to the gym? About how long did it take you to hit a stride? That's a good question. You know, we always fumble the ball, right? So you're always going to make some progress and then ah, something happened. You backslide, make some progress, something happened. That's the old self. I call that the old self is going to come back to try and pull you back, right? Because the old self is he's an MFer. He wants you to come back, right? Because the old version of you that was a loser is like, hey, come back and be with me. It's easy back here. It's safe back here, right? Come on, you can just, you can go back to drinking it. You know, that, that progress thing, that personal development thing, putting yourself out there, finding a woman, possibly getting hurt. That's scary. Come back to the dark place. Men need to realize that you're not going to have a perfect path forward. And I always use this phrase. It's fascinating because I was in a suicidal place. So I have to use this tactically, but I want to kill myself. I want to kill the old me, kill that dude off, kill the dude off that makes the excuses that doesn't have the confidence that doesn't have the know-how to get to the next level, kill them off and do everything you can to become that guy. So get around guys that are doing big things, go to events, network, watch YouTube videos, read. If you're sitting on your couch every night as a dude and you don't have a net worth of above a million dollars and you live with other people and you don't have a girlfriend and you look down and you see a beer gut, are you sitting on your couch scrolling girls dance on TikTok, bro? Like you, you have no control over your life or your disciplines. Where I was going with that is that, that you can hit a stride within two to three months of just consistency. Kill your old self off, drop the habits you know aren't serving you. Listen, we all have that little voice, men and women. We know when things aren't good for us, right? A lot of guys are addicted to porn. You know that, you know that when you go to do that, you know it's wrong. There's nothing fulfilling in your soul about watching women on a screen at your house alone. There's nothing fulfilling about that. That's not God's design. God's design is for you to find a woman in the flesh that you can connect with, that you can protect, that you can love, that can love you. That is the highest form to me as a man. The highest form as a man is having a woman that it feels safe and secure enough with you. And it's just one woman, by the way, gents, like you'd only need one. The point is that the highest calling for you in your life that will make you feel the most fulfilled, more than alcohol, more than drugs, more than the quick dopamine hit of pornography is to actually show up and create that guy. So it might take you a year. It might take you two years to really make some massive progress. But guess what? What's the old phrase? The time's going to pass anyway. Question is, what are you going to do with it? Love that. Yeah. What's the difference between, or is there a difference to you between the guy who gets up and goes to the gym and does all of these external things to get a particular outcome, like to get the girl or to make the money versus doing it for a more wholesome internal mm -hmm. reason? Does it matter? Do you think? Absolutely. hundred percent. Energy matters. Energy matters. I think women, especially a woman like yourself, if you're attuned to what the energy and the flow and the intention, intentions, everything of a man, a woman like yourself, a high value woman will know and can feel when a dude is just doing it for the looks or just doing it for the external, right? There's a big difference between a dude that goes because he knows what physical power and capability is, that he's confident. There's a lot of guys that are in shape. I came from the bodybuilding world before I got into finances, right? When I was actually my brokest is when I was in my best shape because all I did was lift weights. That was covering up all of the stuff I was running from, right? So I took all the steroids and all the things and I don't do that now, but I was a big dude. I was also broke because I was running, okay? I know a lot of guys that have a great external look, but internally they're little boys. They're little boys. They have no network. I literally know guys in the bodybuilding community that have shoes, like they have big shoe collections and they think that's really cool. I'm like, bro, you're 42, what are you doing? Like you, you literally, your wife pays the bills. You know what I'm saying? And you have a shoe collection and a couple of fees and big arms. Like, big deal. Okay. But that's the thing is that women, high value women know when a guy is like just doing it for attention versus, oh, that's his identity. Like he is fit. He is honorable. He is honest. He is a protector versus I'm trying to be in shape so I can get girls because ultimately again, high value women know that, okay, cool. What's what good is a six pack if you can't take care of me emotionally. And it can feel manipulative as well. Yes. Yep. Yeah. He's 100%. just trying to, he's trying to manipulate me 
into mm-hmm. liking him or respecting him versus just being someone who is respectable and doesn't care honestly if people like him or not yep. I'm curious it sounds like you you borrowed your love for your dog when you didn't have love for yourself like yeah. you were like I have to live for my dog in this moment because I don't have enough love for myself right. what did that shift for you where you started living for yourself and loving yourself wow that's a great question very good questions so I think, and again, I think that the inherent, oh, I want to protect and take care of this being is an inherently noble masculine thing. But yeah, the love for the self is, that's massive. It's huge. Confidence. A man's confidence and like, hey, I can just sit with me. I'm astounded at how many men can't just sit alone and just be with themselves. One of my good buddies, Sean Whalen, he did a, a piece at a conference at, a, at the Wake Up Warrior Conference. Was, I'm going to actually plug them. I have no affiliation with them. I'm friends with Garrett White, who runs that. Phenomenal. I actually went through that program. It's a big part of why I am who I am today. And Garrett White runs the Warrior Program, and it's all about men addressing like their insecurities, who they are, their identity, their issues with like pornography or addiction, whatever. And it's cultivating the man, right? Sean Whalen, Lions Not Sheep founder, spoke at that event, and he stood on stage for 45 minutes and said nothing. He said nothing, just stood there stoic and the entire room was silent and men started standing up and didn't know what to do. And one guy went up to him and tried to shake his hand 45 minutes in the last two minutes, he stood there and he said, some of y'all are so uncomfortable with your own silence that you can't just shut up and sit still in a room with your brothers for 45 minutes. How do you think you're going to listen to what God has to say to you? the most profound silence I've ever heard in my life. And it spoke more than any words could have. And what that means is that men are so far removed from their internal dialogue with themselves and with the creator, okay? And if you're on this call and you're like, I don't believe in God, cool, that's great, that's your choice, you have free will. God made you to have the free will not to believe in him. The reality is that something put us here. Something has a divine creation of, hey, the consciousness of people are here, You're grown into a body. You're on this earth. You're interacting. You're here, bro. So let's figure it out together. And the reality is if you don't shut up and sit down as a man and just be, that's the place that you figure out who you are. That's where you figure out your calling, your purpose, your struggles, your successes in the silence. And ultimately the reality is with this stuff is that men don't do the inner work because they don't ever shut up long enough to actually listen to their inner voice It's just all external, right? It's like, I got to do this and I got to get this and I got to get the attention from the girl. And it's all external seeking. I got to have a life where I'm liked or loved. And that is filling a void of loving just who you are as a man. Okay. And the question might be, well, then how do I love myself, Dave? Here's the thing. Keep the promises to yourself. Stop cutting corners. Stop skipping the gym. Stop watching porn. Stop drinking when you should be eating healthy and drinking water. Like, In my darkest moments, I felt bad about myself because I would revert to the things I knew didn't serve the future me, and I knew I was better. I knew I was better, but I kept giving in to the old dude. I didn't fight for it. I just let it happen. And a little bit at a time, just like gaining weight, right? We all know what it's like. You look in the mirror one day and you're naked. You're like, wow, where did my midsection go? Why do I have a spare tire? This is gross. And then you have to make a game plan and hold yourself accountable to the future self. You have to say, okay, I'm going to stop doing X, Y, Z so that I can lose the weight. The weight didn't come on overnight and it's not going to come off overnight. So we live in this perpetual cycle as men, especially everybody, but as men, we live in this perpetual cycle of we do things that don't serve us over time. That compounds, right? So like compounding is a big thing I always talk about. Compounding actions, far more powerful than compounding money. So if it's negative compounding actions, yeah, that's why people get to a place of near depression and suicide. Compounding actions in a positive way can create a life that you could never even dream of. And I could go deep into the law of attraction and visualization and all that stuff. And that's not woo. I'm sitting here as a dude that you look at and be like, wow, you a bodybuilder? No, I'm in the financial world, but I also practice like visualization principles that work, right? I'm big on meditation. People, usually I say that and they're like, what? You're supposed to have dreads to meditate or something. I don't know. (laughs) That was my next question for you is what does this look like on a day-to-day basis for you? Mm -hmm. What did it look like then? What does it look like now when you say sit with yourself? I was going to ask you, does that look like meditation? Does that look like mirror work? Does it look like journaling? Does it look like literally just sitting in silence? 
So I'd love for you to share with people your process around meditation and visualization and anything else that you use to, yep. to explore what's happening for you internally and to open up that space to hear, to hear God's voice. Sure. Sure. Amazing question. You just had the ringers. You just had all the questions here. This is great. So I, I have to give credit where credit's due. Again, a lot of the tools that I have, I formulated some tools and strategies on my own, but a lot of stuff, let's just be real. People learn from other people and they implement it. So one of the biggest tools that I have that I use is called the stack. Garrett J. White created this program and it's really, it's not a program. It's a, it's a method. If you sit down with yourself and for me specifically, yeah, I take time, meditate, I journal out thoughts and feelings and things. And then I go through this process called the stack. And it's pretty much what am I feeling and why are the facts around the feelings? Why am I feeling that? And is it true or is it not true? Does it serve me? Do I get fruit from these feelings? There's so many different things that go on in our head as men, chaos. I got to do this. I got to do that provider. I got to make money. I got to survive. I got to fix my relationship, whatever. And you have to quiet that down and you have to clear it all out. So for me, tactically, it's, yeah, meditation, journaling, actually sitting with my thoughts and then stacking out why I'm, I'm having a trigger or why I'm upset over something or why I feel like I'm not progressing in a certain way that I think I should be. And always look into my higher self for the answers and always looking to connect with God as to what's God saying. Sometimes we just need to listen. You just have to be quiet. Because how can you receive a message if you're constantly putting something out? So meditation, journaling, doing things that I don't want to do and initially cold showers. I actually like them now. It used to be a thing where it's, oh God, this is terrible. And then I reframed even that, right? Stories. That's another one. I can get, we could talk, we could do a whole hour on stories. The stories you tell yourself, is it serving you or not serving you? For example, get into a cold shower, three minute cold shower in the morning before I meditate or go to the gym. Or if I go to the gym, the showers at the gym I have are actually way colder than my house gets. So sometimes I'll shower there. It's like an ice bath. But before you get into that ice bath or ice shower, you're like, oh, I don't want to do this. Man, this is going to suck. Pause. This isn't going to suck. This is something that's challenging as a man that if I force myself to go through, I will grow. I also know that it has health benefits aside from psychological benefits. I know that it's going to help me to actually raise my body temperature and lose weight. There's all these great things it can do. So why am I looking at it in a negative light? I don't want to do this. This is going to suck. It's not going to suck. It's going to be great. In the military, we said, embrace the suck. It's a true thing. If you embrace the suck, a new person comes out on the other side. So you hear it all the time. People are like, oh, I would never do an ice bath. That sounds uncomfortable. Yeah, that's the point. When you lead a life of discomfort, it brings you into a place of comfort and joy. When you constantly run away from discomfort, you're going to sit around uncomfortable and unhappy with yourself, period. The modern day man has so many comforts and that's why we have a weak society of little boys because we came from a time when our great grandfather stormed Normandy. And yet now a guy will drop his iPhone and have a hissy fit and be like, whoa, my whole life's over. I can't scroll Instagram. I got to go find a new phone. Really, bro? And I'll sit here to preach and be like, I'm the toughest dude out there. There's way tougher guys than me, but the reality is that on the spectrum of things I've been through, combat training, been to war zones, seen people blown up and killed. None of my friends, fortunately, none of my people in my squad, but I've just seen a lot of really dark stuff and went to war with myself and being near suicidal. There's a certain realm that you play in that you're like, hey, there's a lot of dark stuff I've been through and it fortifies you as a man. But the reality is that you can go through those things and let it defeat you and turn you into a little sissy lala because of how you show up. I see a lot of times vets have this grief that haunts them and they just never get to the next place of healing, acceptance, growth. They come home and they might still be performing. They might still be producing. They might still be making money and going through the motions, but intuitively, these are friends of mine and intuitively I can feel that there's a broken part yeah. of them. And so I'm curious what you would say to those guys. Yeah. And that's like a soft spot for me because I've lost friends to suicide after they come home. I have a friend, Douglas James, who does some work with vets. I have a lot of friends actually who do work with vets in that space. And it's actually something that I'm dabbling myself with getting into and wanting to lead guys because the truth is that we don't have a great, and I'm not here to bash any systems, but the VA system is not the greatest. Once we come home, the healthcare the way they handle things is, and it depends on the city you're in. It could be good or it could be bad, but the entire system is the best thing that there's like, you call the main hotline and you're suicidal. They give you an option to press seven to talk to somebody. Okay, that's great. But what are we doing beyond that? You know what I mean? I don't know if it's still the statistic, but if 22 guys are taking their life or 22 veterans in general are taking their life every day, we need to address this because it is, there's no outlet for healing. Trauma is a real thing. And that's another thing. We're finally to a point, I believe in society where we can talk about trauma and men 
for the most part, will be like, oh yeah, that's a real thing. I have that too. Whereas 10 years ago, it was like, oh, guys don't have, that's a woman's thing. Like women have trauma because they're weak and they can't handle hard things. Not true. Like we're all human beings. We all have trauma. So whether it's abandonment trauma from birth or you have parental issues or you were molested as a child, doesn't matter. If you have a perfect life and then you join the military and then you go through combat, you have trauma now, right? Even if you didn't get a leg blown off, you have mental trauma. So Human beings are not supposed to be put in a position where you're trying to kill each other or you're on the front lines of something and you're like, that's the enemy. I'm these people and we're supposed to do this and kill each other. It's really not inherently what God had designed for us. Really, it's not. So anything that's outside of God's design, here we can go back to a spiritual conversation. Anything that's outside of the design of the divinity of our existence will cause us trauma, sleeping around, suicidal thoughts, combat, divorce, like anything that doesn't adhere to the design that God had created for us is going to create something inside of you. There's a rift that you need to talk to someone about and heal from. So for my veterans specifically, I just wish there were better programs that had reach out programs in therapy. That's another big one for men. Guys, go to therapy, talk to someone, like get a great male therapist. I get it. It might feel odd to talk to a woman about masculine problems, just like women sometimes feel uncomfortable talking to men about being sexually molested when they were young. You have to talk to someone you feel comfortable with, okay? And it can be the opposite sex. I had a great female therapist at one point. It just it comes down to what are you actually trying to handle? Um, I love the, we can go off in so many different subjects with this, but I love the MDMA and psychedelic side of therapy where that is proven to help heal and re retrain people's brains to not be stuck in that trauma loop. Everything's a trauma loop. To close up the conversation about veterans, yeah, I absolutely think that we need better help for that. There's so many men and women, but so many men that come back from combat and they just, it's kind of, thanks for almost getting yourself killed for your country and now figure it out. Oh, by the way, you're mentally messed up and drinking all the time. Yeah, you should probably seek some help. Pat on the back. And it's really, that's what we're doing to these people. It's insane because that's another reason I got in the financial industry. The entire structure of our government, the IRS, taxes, of the financial industry, it's all based around methods of control for dollars. They don't care about people. They do not care about people. Republican, Democrat, most politicians really do not care about people. I do not care what side of the aisle you're on, period. So anyways, I kind of went into some different tangents there. So draw me back in. <laughs> I, I totally agree. And I would add that we also tell them, hey, if you cry about it, you're weak. Isn't oh. that ironic? Because they just came back from war. Yeah. But they're not allowed to cry because that makes them weak. That just goes to show how deep this societal yeah. message and programming is. And yeah. men internalize that from a young age. And it also gets tricky. We can have a whole other conversation about how we tell the girls, only girls cry and you're weak if you cry. And then they have these associations with women's emotions and it makes them uncomfortable and makes them think the, there's something wrong with the woman or right. wrong with them because they couldn't make her happy. It's so toxic. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and that's what we're breaking down here. So circling way back, you said sometimes you have to do the hard things in order for effort to be effortless, basically. Yeah. Sometimes you have to embrace the suck. Now, my question for you is if a man who is in a toxic relationship is listening to this and then the story he tells himself is I'm just hanging on, I'm just embracing the suck. What's the difference between that well, and what you're describing? Yes, absolutely. And everything's contextual, right? Embracing the suck in a workout and pushing through is different than I've been in this toxic relationship for six years and I just need to stay because I want to make it work way different. I definitely think that there's always going to be a side of very rare instances when a relationship ends or should end is it actually like 100% one person's fault? Like usually when you get to the point where relationship is toxic in the very beginning, now that's another conversation. Most people come into relationships bringing old baggage, old trauma, old things from past relationships, from childhood that they haven't handled. And when you don't handle that, especially we want to talk about energetically and physicality and sexuality. When you energetically enter into a new relationship with somebody and you haven't healed all your old stuff and you start having physical relationship with someone and you have sex, you're passing on the trauma. So that's one piece is, are you whole and healthy before you enter into a new relationship? And you don't have to be hundred percent. Listen, you don't, you can be working on things and you meet somebody and you're like, Oh, I'm not quite ready for a relationship. But it doesn't mean you're like, Hey, go away. I'll talk to you in a year when I'm ready. Like you can have a blended reality of, Hey, I'm still working through some stuff and I'm not quite ready to be hundred percent serious, but I really enjoy you. I like spending time with you. Let's grow together. And sometimes that can create one of the most healthy relationships because you can heal outside and inside of a relationship. 
to answer more strategically, I think that men that find themselves in a toxic relationship currently, and they're trying to figure out what to do. First of all, ask yourself, how much of a role do you have to play in that? If there are things going on with her, that's her responsibility to seek help and work through. And if that person is doing their job, well, are you doing your job? As a man, if you're like, oh, she's got issues, bro. I'm gonna, we're not going to work out. Like she's probably cheating on me, X, Y, Z, whatever. What issues do you have that you're not talking to a therapist about, but you're requiring her hoping that she gets help so she can show up better? So there's a lot of times I see men put all the blame on the woman. And that's like a societal thing. I feel like men, and I don't get me wrong. There are some, there's narcissistic men and there's narcissistic women. I was in a six-year relationship with just this, where I wasn't doing my part. So I was creating trauma. I wasn't giving her the attention and fulfilling her needs, but she also had some things that she was dealing with that she wasn't addressing. And it was just a compound effect where we were both not doing the things. And like, I thought she was toxic. She thought I was toxic. The truth was we both were. So the reality is though, is that sometimes people figure that out. They part ways and you usually see one person works on things and grows and the other person sticks and they just repeat the next relationship the same way. And it's unfortunate. So I'd encourage the men that are out there that are like, my relationship's toxic and it's all her fault. Is it though? What is probably your fault? If you're constantly on your phone, ignoring her and you're complaining that she's not sleeping with you enough, maybe you should realize that you're not filling up her emotional bucket and you shouldn't expect her to fill up your physical needs because you're neglecting. Like women, we're all sexual creatures. I get that. But men are more, we lead with sexuality and women lead with emotional. So again, this is one of those things where it's an energetic conversation. Men, this is also not what I'm saying. Don't start just showing up for her and being like, oh, I want to talk to you more and have an emotional bond because you just want more sex because that's not genuine nor authentic. You should genuinely want to spend time with your significant other. Look them in the eyes. Like here's one really good thing I ask guys to do. I said, when's the last time you've actually looked at your girlfriend in the eye? Like just, or your wife? just looked at them in the eyes and like connected and had eye contact as you were talking to them. Cause that's a connection. Oh, I, I don't know. We talk. Yeah. But are you averting your eyes because you're, there's something going on in your relationship. You don't want to face that you're feeling uncomfortable. Like it's actually uncomfortable at a certain point in a relationship that's gotten toxic to just look into that person's eyes and connect. And that's crazy because that's because you're subconsciously avoiding the thing that you know you need to work on, right? I love this person, but I'm like, I'm not going to look you in the eyes. Very dangerous. Vulnerability is a big one for men. It's, I'll gloat on myself for just 30 seconds. Dudes, like I'm 220 pounds. I could probably wrestle all of you into a mat, most of you. I'm not scared of most dudes. I have combat experience. I'm confident in who I am. I make millions of dollars. Trust me when I tell you, Sometimes when I meditate or I think about my life or I think about what I have and I think about who I've created or I think about like my father who battled cancer and now he's good, thank God. When I actually tap into the emotional realm of who I am as a man, I'll sit there and I'll meditate and I will have a tear streaming down my face. I will cry out of pure emotion because I'm tapped into the emotion of who I am. You have to learn that you are a whole being. You don't just have a brain and arms and a body, you have a brain, a body, and a heart and a soul. And if you're missing the heart and soul piece, that's the core of the whole equation. So if you don't think it's okay to cry or be vulnerable, I have a really good friend, his name is Jimmy Rex. He runs a men's group. It's called, we are the, they, and they is referring to the men that lead in this society, but don't have good brotherhood. And they are creating a brotherhood of men to get together. These guys are all like rich fit. Awesome. They get together and they talk about hard shit and they talk about what they're going through and they're talking about their marriages or what they need to focus on or losing a loved one or a parent passing away or a business failing and them losing millions of dollars. Like they get together, they talk about it and they hug and they cry it out. Like it's powerful, but you have to realize I'm too tough to do that. That's your problem because you're actually not tough. Yeah. You're afraid. Yeah. You're afraid of your own emotion. It's what is it? <laughs> Children are tougher than you. A child will cry and have zero shame about it. Oh shit, that hurt. Oh shit. They embrace the emotion. And then guess what? They, they clear up the tears and they move on. That's another thing. Here's, I actually talked about this with my team last night on our, our company call. Why is it that children can fall down, scrape their knees, get up, 
fall down. When they're learning to walk, fall down, get up, fall down, get up. They will keep trying over and over again. But as an adult, we try one new thing, meditate or go to therapy or try a a healthy conversation in our relationship. And if it fails one time, we give up. It's fascinating, isn't it? We are so less resilient as adults than we were as children. They take it personally because their self-esteem or self-concept is based on results. Yep. Yep. And so they shut down when they don't instantly get the results that they are looking for. They don't instantly get the validation, the approval, the respect, et cetera, because their self-concept is externalized. That's very good. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. What you were talking about with these successful men, it reminds me of a really important point that I want to make. And that is that there's a myth that successful men, I'm using successful loosely, and that could mean a million different things, but men who set their mind to something and accomplish it, they can create, they can embrace the suck, et cetera. There's this myth that these guys don't have emotional problems. They don't have marital issues. They don't have insecurities. And what I often find is that they actually do and have had those things. Sometimes they're the most insecure and that's what drove the performance. But the difference is the really happy ones, the ones that are the most fulfilled, because there are a lot that aren't fulfilled. They're the ones that have found the balance between having an open heart and boundaries. Mm -hmm. You really do need both. And sometimes that's the ceiling that men hit because they, they learn the boundaries. They do the red pill stuff. They learn the boundaries, but their heart's so closed or they have a bleeding heart and their heart's open, but they don't have boundaries and they get taken advantage of. And they go, how come I can't be successful in relationships or in business? And these men that are really fulfilled and hit their stride, they really do have a good combination of both and do embrace their emotions, but also know how to set boundaries. I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. No, that's, that's deep. Wow. I've been on, on, on a few podcasts and it's, you're probably the best interviewer I've had thus far. Very good questions. I believe that it is. And it, it's always a balance that you're seeking to find, right? There's always going to be things that happen or that you do that you it test yourself. And you're like, I could have handled that better. Or I should have had more boundaries or whatever. For me, I really struggle with being too much of a giver to my team. And at first I thought it was because I'm just a giving person. And I do believe in that. I believe in giving way more than you should, especially even monetarily or to your church or just your energy and your passion. But at a certain point, then it becomes, okay, is it a law of diminishing return where if people need me all the time and I'm always giving, giving, and then I exhaust myself, what kind of a leader am I actually showing up as? And it's the same in relationships, right? If you're not setting boundaries for for male and female boundaries are for just as much for as another person as they are for you. It's like, Hey, I don't think that this is healthy. This interaction, we should set some boundaries around this. Right. And actually at one of the events, I was actually just at Keaton Hoskins held an amazing event on Limitless. And I had a lot of good speakers and there was a speaker on stage. It was talking about when people don't respect your boundaries, they actually are doing it out of one of two reasons. One, totally accidental. They don't really understand the boundary, but they don't understand what boundaries even mean, which is a whole nother subject, but they don't really mean to cross it. But then there's the other type of person that knows what the boundary is and purposely crosses it because there's something about that boundary that triggers them into realizing that they don't have boundaries and they actually want to cross it to test you and see how you hold to it. So it's very fascinating, but I definitely think that the boundary of not being too, and it's something I have battled with, not being too much of a giver, but also not being the guy that's just, I'm never going to take time for anybody and I'm not going to give anything. And it's all about me. And I got to, I'm just too busy. That's the thing is there's always going to be a balance. And I have people that hit me up all the time. Hey, you're free to jump on a call. And I'm like, I'm never free to just jump on a call and do, there has to be a why. That has to be a reason. Is it aligned with my mission? Is it going to help somebody? If you're just wanting some free advice, I'm 500 an hour, or you can join my coaching program where I can go through all of this stuff in depth. Oh, I don't really want to pay for it. Okay. So then you don't actually find the information valuable because you're not willing to pay. See what I mean? It's like a, but then you also, Hey, somebody hits me up and they're suicidal. I'm not going to charge them $500 to jump on a call. So it's got to be, it's situational. And I definitely think for a lot of high achievers, finding the boundary between having a bleeding heart for people, but also not allowing everybody to be a time succubus. There's definitely a middle zone that you have to find. And it's, you have to find what works for you. And ask yourself why you have a bleeding heart, because sometimes they will overgive because there's a covert contract there. There's an unspoken expectation of return. And they often get very upset and annoyed and bitter when they don't get the respect, love, validation, or approval after they overgive. And they don't even realize that 
they were operating that way typically because they learned in childhood. There's some program from childhood. If I am a good boy, then mommy will love me. And so they go through life going, well, I just take out the trash. If I just do X, Y, and Z and overgive, 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 then surely somebody's going to see it and appreciate it and love me and validate me. And so I also would offer to check your intentions if you are a quote unquote overgiver or have a bleeding heart or an open heart. What's the point behind that? Because if you don't back it up with boundaries, what you're saying is basically, please love me like anybody because <laughs> right? I don't love yeah. myself. Yeah. No, that's very good. That's very good. And it, what's interesting about these conversations is that I doubt most people really go this deep into why they feel or think what they think. And, and it is fascinating that I'm sure you'll agree. It's like almost everything ties back to something in childhood. It, it really does. And if you really think about it, like we're all just grown babies. Like what is an adult really? Let's just be real. It's just, you're a child and then you learn all these developmental things and you might fully develop or not develop, but then you have traumas and things you didn't address and you don't even aren't aware of, but you move through life and you just bring it with you. The baggage, that's why they call it baggage. You're carrying bags of shit on your back and sometimes unknowingly. And it all reverts back to childhood stuff. So I'm really intuitive. And when I'm walking around in the grocery store, I can actually see the little boy inside of men. If he hasn't reparented that version of himself, I can see it in his face, the way he's carrying himself. I can feel it. And I have a soft spot for that. Cause I'm like, oh my gosh, I just want to give that guy a hug. But at the same time, I'm not attracted to that person who right. hasn't reparented himself. And to your point, done the hard things and gone, look, kid, we, it's time to grow up. We can't right. be a victim anymore. We have to control our habits. We can't be controlled by pleasure, by external validation. It's time to really pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. Sometimes mm -hmm. that means crying it out. Sometimes that means taking our power back. Sometimes that means owning all of the problems that we have. And so many men are stunted. They're essentially children walking around in grow men's bodies. They're stunted because to your point, they really haven't up until recently had permission to yeah. go in and explore that aspect of themselves without it being considered weak or, or that there's something wrong with them. Right. And so now we're thankfully removing the stigma and the shame because we all have an inner child that needs to be reparented and it can only be done by ourselves. And oftentimes we try to get our partner to do it. And that always ends it in, in catastrophe because you're essentially making your partner responsible for something that you only, you can be responsible for. And that person is going to push back and go, I'm not your mom. I'm not your dad. This is something you need to work out in therapy or with a coach or through journaling or something, because it's not my responsibility. Yeah, that's deep. That's a whole nother subject that can be, and you see a lot with parents that as the child grows up into adulthood and the child starts doing very good, sometimes parents that have their own unhealed trauma will start to go to the child and almost want to be parented by the child because now they're trying to fulfill wounds that are not healed. Very fascinating. I've experienced some of that as well, not in my own family, but people I care about. Yeah, it's definitely trauma is the inner work and trauma is the number one thing I think that is just overlooked in general. Totally. I've actually experienced that too in my family. I've never heard anyone say that. So thank you for saying that. Yeah. Okay. So I want to go ahead and start to wrap up. One of my last questions for you is when we started this conversation, you said something about how you feel that men are responsible for leading. I think you meant in the context of relationships, but I'd love for you to share what you meant by that. Yeah. And as much as I doubt you have a hyper ultra feminist crowd, right? So I'm, I'm going to probably guess you don't. But I think that traditional masculinity, the way it sh should be real divine masculine, even that gets labeled as bad or toxic now, because it's oh, you should be opening doors for women, they could do it on their own. It's like, dude, it's called respect. I open doors for men, women, old, young, it doesn't matter. So now we're starting to evolve into this weird place in society where wow, this is a deep subject, but we get on the subject of like, gender fluidity. Like we're being groomed almost to get rid of the notion that there is masculine and feminine. Listen, that is just the nature of the universe. There is dark and light. There is a spectrum of things, right? And that is how we came to be because the masculine and the feminine creates. So what's interesting is that it's okay, no matter what you're told in society, as a man, it's okay to say, you know what, I am going to make myself into a strong leader. The world needs strong leaders right? The book, Hard Times Create, that whole book, the, I forget the actual title. I think I actually have the book in, in my other office room here. But the idea there is if you don't have leadership in a society, and listen, 
the way everything goes is there's always going to be an 80, 20 rule. That's like the law of the universe. 20% of people are going to do what needs to be done and be leaders and lead a good life. The other 80% is going to fall into that just void of like average follow the herd mentality. So I think more than ever right now, society, and when I say society, a lot of times what I actually mean is the government and media programming us. It's like making real men think that's not okay. So when, you know, responsibilities be a leader in a relationship, yes, but just in life. Like if something goes down in a public place, whether it's a mass shooting or whatever, are you going to act? Are men, how many men are actually trained and carry and are trained to like, Active shooter, I'm there, I'm going to save lives, as opposed to, oh my God, take cover and then be with the women and children. Like instinctively, a lot of men have had that bred out of them that like, oh, active shooter, I'm not trained for that. I'll let the police handle it. Well, even the police are not doing their job as much as they used to because they're being trained and groomed not to be masculine and not to be a provider and a protector. So yeah, it's a super deep subject, but men need to really step up in all areas, not just the relationship, but in society and say, you know what? I'm going to be a voice. I'm going to be a voice and step up during this whole last two years of COVID. I'm not going to go super political, but last two years when a lot of weird stuff was happening and people were being told to do this and that and this and that, like where were all, there was not a lot of men stepping out being like, not in my community. You are not doing that. Not my family. It was like, Oh, I guess we're just like, we just have to do what we're told. Hey, do you remember what happened in different points in history when men didn't stand up and do what was supposed to be done? It's called mass extermination. Yeah, it's a whole deep subject that I'm truly passionate. There were points in the last two years that I was like, we all need to stand up. Men, women, everybody, we need to stand up and start doing something a little bit different because if you can't see the control mechanisms that are being placed on society, and that's ultimately it is. It's up to the men to lead the charge in hard times because if they don't, who's gonna do it? That's just the truth. And it's okay to discuss gender roles. Listen, the majority of construction workers are men. For a reason, if you go out to an oil rig, if you go out to an oil rig in the middle of the ocean and you guys literally mining, digging, drilling for oil, you probably have one or two women on the whole place. And guess what? They're probably doing admin work. They're not out there turning the big wrenches, getting dirty. It's just the nature of the universe. And that doesn't mean that women are less than. In fact, in my opinion, women are powerful in much different ways. Men can't birth a child. That's one of the most honorable and powerful things you can do. So it's, it's not a conversation of who's better. It's a difference in what we're called to be. Yeah. Most of my listeners and even people who come to me to work with me, it doesn't matter how much money they have because money only solves money problems. They come in across all socioeconomic spectrum. I'll come in saying very similar things. And that is she cheated on me. She's a narcissist. I took out the trash and I did everything and she still disrespected me. She still wouldn't sleep with me, et cetera. And when you talk about men leading, that can be very triggering for them because they'll go, she's the problem. And I've been such a great guy. And so what am I supposed to do with that? I think I just need to get rid of her, but also I'm attached, not connected. I'm attached to her. There's a trauma bond. They're just like, they're in it. So what does leadership look like in your opinion? What does that look like in that situation? Yeah. And just so you know, I've been there. I was there at one point where it was like, again, that toxic relationship, but I was a part of it. So it wasn't laying all the blame. I had to really take a step back and analyze me. And at a certain point, we, we actually tried to try again and it just didn't work because after a certain point, you have way too much trauma attachment. It's just, you just need to let it go. But at a certain point you realize as a man, you say, okay. Um, and when I hear that, well, she's a narcissist and X, Y, Z. Yeah, that might be true. That could be part of the problem. But more often than not, even if that is true, that piece It's a lot of it is because of how you haven't been showing up as a man. So analyzing, okay, have I actually been leading? And that's the hardest part. Telling yourself the truth as a man, getting rid of all the stories and being able to get very granular on, okay, maybe she is some of these ways because of how I haven't treated her. If you're not showing up emotionally and you're not creating a space for a woman to feel safe, what do you think she's going to do? She's going to go create her own masculinity, her own safety, her own stories of survival. And then it just creates this narrative where you think she's the problem. Well, she might be part of it, but you're also part of it. So being able to say, okay, you know what? It's going to be a bumpy road, but I'm going to start showing up differently. I'm going to sit the woman down that I love and care about, even if she's a narcissist in certain ways, or she's doing these things and she's withholding sex from me or whatever. You'd be surprised as a man, 
if you just start showing up and be like, I'm going to start taking responsibility, the whole mindset, like, you know what? Everything's my fault. We're here because I haven't led you as a man and I'm going to do better. I think just that one sentence would probably start to bring a wall down for that significant other. You know what? I just want to tell you that I haven't been leading as a man. I've had some realizations. I'm not who I want to be. And I want to do everything in my power to make it better, to step up, to lead, to make you feel comfortable, to make you feel safe. And I just want you to let you know, I'm sorry, but that changes today. I don't know. Maybe half of the women that hear that would be like, oh, actually, now I kind of want to have sex with you. (laughs) because they've probably never heard that before because it's a totally different dude. It's not this. You're the problem and you got all these issues and ah, blah, blah, blah. And it's always, it's literally a little boy having a hissy fit as opposed to, you know what? Ashley, we've been through a lot and I've done some reflecting. I just want to let you know that I'm not who I want to be and that's okay. And I know that you're not perfect, but I just want to take the opportunity to tell you that I just, I want to make some changes. And as a man, I know I'm not who I want to be. And that changes today. I don't know what that looks like. And I know it's going to be a journey, but I'm committed to myself, not just this relationship, but I'm committed to myself. And whether this works or not, I just want you to know that I care for you. I want things to be like they were in the beginning when there wasn't any of this strife, but I'm going to do whatever it takes. And if, even if that means we need to separate and maybe we don't get back together, but I think right now I just need to focus on me and making myself into the man truly who I'm called to be because I'm tired of letting myself down. I'm tired of letting me down and you deserve better too. You'd be surprised how quick narcissism would go away. I love that because I could hear the guys say, I do take responsibility and it's obviously it's always my fault. And she says, it's always my fault. And that's not what you're saying to do at all. You're saying, no, you're doing this for you. You're doing the man is saying that for himself. And I was going to clarify and you went ahead and did it. It's this is I'm doing this for me because I'm not showing up as the man that I want to be. I'm not showing up as the leader that I am and could be. I'm not holding myself accountable. I'm not in integrity. I'm not taking care of myself. I'm not loving myself. I'm trying to get external validation and I'm operating as such. And I'm changing that today. And at that point, especially if he backs it up, she might throw a little fit timber chant. She's just not used to it. Right. Give the kid the Snickers and you always gave the kid the Snickers. And so the first time you say no, they're going to throw a tantrum that might happen for a little bit, but eventually she's either going to relax and surrender yeah. and more in her feminine and trust you more because she sees that you're backing everything up with actions. You keep your word, et cetera, or she's going to be repelled because she cannot control you anymore. And then that's when the true narcissist would show up. Right. And in that case, you don't want to be attached to that person anyway. Yeah, very good. And one thing I will say for the guys, and I, because I've been there, for the guys that are currently like going through a breakup and their mentality is, and you always see this, right? It's, well, I'm going to get the girl back. I'm going to, I'm going to, they sit down and they're getting broke up with. And their response is, you know what? You're right. I haven't been the man. I'm going to, I'm going to show you, I'm going to do better so that you can like, see me as like somebody you want to be with again. No, like that's, you're still seeking the thing as a means to the end. I want to have you back as a woman. Oh, sense of loss. I'm going to become the man now to get you back. No, that's not why you do it. You do it because you just need to be the man. And that's true leadership. I'll stand on a hill alone with what I believe because I'm truly okay with being alone. And that's the biggest thing I think a lot of men and women, but men need to realize if you're not okay with just being by yourself, you don't need to seek a woman yet. Like you need to be able to stand on a hill alone before you can seek a woman. You need to be able to stand on a hill alone and be emotionally unavailable. Some men will put themselves on that hill on quote unquote principle. And really those are just walls to keep other people out. So it really depends on who you're being as a person when you're standing on that hill as well. I think it's being able to be alone and have joy and peace being alone. Men, if you do the inner work and you're like, when am I ready for a relationship again? If you have a moment where you're like, I'm truly happy of this MF or that I just built over the last two years or year, whatever. And uh, I'm good. I don't need a partner. That's when you're ready for a partner. Exactly. I love that. Is there anything else that you would like to share with my listeners, share with these guys that might be going through it or trying to figure out where to even start or what to do? Is there anything else that you feel like we haven't covered? I think that when you have these high level conversations and you start talking about like guys, emotions and relationships and money and who they are, it seems overwhelming. And it almost seems, man, it's just, it's too much. Like I'm never going to get there. Okay. It's just too big of a conversation. I don't know where to start. That's the problem is that I don't think anybody really helps guys to get granular on, okay, here's some action items. Let's analyze what you're doing right now with your body and your mind. Where's your attention? Is it on the phone? Are you reading books? 
Are you meditating? Are you watching porn? Are you going to the gym? Are you eating shitty food? Let's just analyze the day-to-day -day stuff, right? Let's analyze your actual facts and let's start getting you on a path to being more confident and holding promises to yourself. And then from there, you start to build on that with other higher level concepts and okay, how do I I'll transition out of my job and make more money? Or how do I get a promotion? Or how do I invest? How do I start being more disciplined with my money? How do you start dialing in the diet more? Now I lost some weight. Now I want to add some muscle, right? Who do you need to hire? Who do you need to talk to? It's a step-by-step -step thing. You're not going to become the super wealthy, super fit, super emotionally aligned, super strong, confident guy in two months. It's just not going to happen. So I think giving guys the idea that, listen, this is a building process. It's a stripping down and a real rebuilding process. It doesn't have to be overwhelming. Just take it a little bit at a time. And actually... You don't actually need to look at it as I need to add all these things to my life and be all these things. What actually personal development is and becoming a better man is actually getting rid of a lot of stuff. It's addition by subtraction. It's just getting rid of all the old you and just actually becoming who God calls you to be. No, I totally agree with you. And healthy women will notice it and pick up on it without you even having to try. They'll watch you. And it's actually more attractive, at least for me, it's more attractive to see a man in his purpose, on fire, focused, et cetera. And for me to be not an afterthought, but I'm not like, I'm not the center of this man's universe. A healthy woman doesn't want to be the center of your universe. Healthy women are going to be attracted to men who have momentum in their life, have something else going on, who have a purpose, who have a mission, who have integrity, who are taking action. Obviously, we also want them to be emotionally available. And if they want a relationship, they can say that I'm ready for a relationship. I choose you or I'm exploring you or I'm interested in you, et cetera. But they have all of these other things going on yeah. and that will be very attractive to healthy women. And what it will also do is it will repel toxic women who want to monopolize your time energy, yeah. money, attention, because she has her own issues and voids that she's trying to fill through yeah. you. Yep. It's very good and very true. I think that's it. on both sides of the spectrum. We need to look at relationships should be an addition to your life, not your entire life. Just like your career is not your entire identity. It is one aspect to your money, right? And your relationship is, and it is, it's the highest form of that because it, after all, most people are going to be called to date, marry, have children, and pass on a next generation. So it is the highest form, a relationship, an intimate relationship, 100%, the highest form of a bond in this life, but it should not be the only thing that people focus on. And I think a lot of people, because they haven't healed those childhood wounds, they go from relationship to relationship, never building the self and the life and the purpose, and then allowing the relationship to be the addition to the life. And you do, it's a whole other subject, but a lot with people that never focus on themselves, get married young, have kids. And then in their forties, they become extremely disconnected and unhappy with themselves and their marriage. And then they get divorced. Why? Because they never built themselves into the people that they truly loved. And they sought love through the marriage and the kids. So they never built that relationship with themselves. Yeah. And yeah. so also, if you don't do that, how can you build a relationship with someone else? So ideally you build a relationship with yourself she has a relationship with herself and then your relationship with each other is a third party. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So this has been a great conversation, David, where can people find you? So lots of activity on Facebook of DK Hutch. And then on Instagram, I believe it's Hutches with an S H U T C H underscore legacy. And that's more based around my business and things like that. But I do more personal posting and conversations on Facebook. Yep. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here today, David. Yep, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of a podcast for nice guys. For more nice guy tips, follow Ashley at Nice Guy Reform School on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. See you next time on a podcast for nice guys.